the, the, the main focus of activity that's happening nationwide regarding public educational and government ch television channels um, re revolves around the 621 order that the FCC put forward in uh, August of 2019. Municipalities around the country and peg channels like, like yours are actually fighting uh, the order, which has two main components. One component talks about um, um, the ability of municipalities to be able to um, levy what is essentially a telecommunications tax. Um, the FCC is trying to override that and basically eliminate the ability for communities to be able to derive money from, from the use of the right of way. Um, and if you see a theme here, the other thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, basically tip the balance of power between, as they see it, between the cable industry and local communities, because local communities in their mind have been just sort of draining cable companies dry by asking them for free stuff uh, like cable drops, connections, um, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, uh, between head end and origination points. Um, so the order actually sets up a process by which a cable company such as Charter Spectrum could deduct its um, free services against franchise fees. And in Wisconsin, that actually could have a very deleterious effect. Well, so, not, um, not so much. Well, wait, wait for it. Wait okay. for it. Wait for it. Because one of the open items that is, even though you don't get, you don't get a lot of quote unquote free stuff and in-kind services in Wisconsin, you do have channels. And the, the order doesn't specifically put a dollar figure on a channel uh, value, but it opens the door for a cable company to put a dollar value on a, a channel in, let's say, Sheboygan, and then basically deduct the value of the channel against the franchise fee that Sheboygan derives. Well, my understanding right. about that last order, though, was that they were going to come out with an additional order about channels and that they never have. They haven't yet. Right. So, it, so it, it opens the door for it. We're trying to close that door in, in terms of the legal action that we're, and the reason why we're fighting it in, in court, in the Sixth Circuit. It's also the reason why uh, Anna Eshoo in, the, in, in California and Ed Markey in um, Massachusetts in the House and the Senate authored the Protecting Community Television Act, which defines a franchise fee as only monetary support. So that you can't sort of come up with numbers that a cable company can uh, um, unilaterally use to to reduce franchise fee support for the use of public property and public rights of way. Um, so we're fighting that in court. Um, the thing you should know is that case is probably going to be argued late this year, early next year. Um, the briefs have been filed. Uh, intervening briefs are being filed right now. Um, so we don't know if that will be overturned specifically, but that's also a reason to have a legislative fix to ensure that there's never the opportunity for channels to be defunded in any state, let alone Wisconsin, because I know there are some non-Wisconsinites in the room. Yeah. <laughs> even though it's born stuff. Uh, so, you should probably point out though too, is that the FCC did not touch capital equipment and facilities for PEG channels. So that was so standalone in the law but, but the that that is still something that's separated out. Although Wisconsin doesn't have a peg fee uh, for capital equipment, but states that do, that was separate from the 5% cap. Well, and I'd actually, I'd actually, and we're getting a little bit, let me just kind of finish up on PCTA first, Mary. And then let's, let's get to that, that, that specific point, because I think that does affect Wisconsinites a little bit here, because there is some, there, there's been some discussion about what that precisely means, right? And as with anything that involves a lawyer, you know, you have to deal with definitions all the time and what people are precisely saying. Um, and I think there's a dispute about, about that transport to going from the head end to... Um, oh, the, 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 right. Right, and whether transport or not transport could be operating, and, and that's the way the FCC defined it. Correct. Transport is operating. correct. Correct. So they correct. could start charging right. for that. But right. I want to also me, point out to you: you may not realize this, um, Mike, but in the state of Wisconsin, the legislature in the last session 
decreased our franchise. Oh, I know that. I know. I know that. So you're 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 down to four percent support. Right. Coming but from the cable company. That, but that means now we have that little one percent now where we we don't get that money. And theoretically, theoretically, you'd have a little bit of breathing space. But again, right. I just hate to say this. It benefits your organizations. It benefits all our organizations for a franchise fee to be defined as a monetary unit, not oh, as I'm other right. not as other things that you can deduct based upon a whim of a company or something yeah. that's not in a contract or in a state certificate. Right. So, right. so particularly from the Wisconsin standpoint, the Protecting Community Television Act, which is uh, HR uh, 5659, five, has 39 co-sponsors. Only one member of the House of Representatives from the state of Wisconsin. Only one, and that's Gwen Moore. So even though you had support from folks like Mark Pocan um, uh, in the rulemaking process, uh, last year, we only have one co-sponsor in the House and one co-sponsor in the Senate. It's Tammy Baldwin. Um, in, in other states within the region, you actually have uh, some more support. Um, some of the Minnesota contingent actually has been, has been picking up co-sponsors now. So I think there are now three co-sponsors in, in the House uh, in Minnesota. Um, Ilhan Omar, uh, Betty McCollum, uh, and uh, Dean Phillips just signed on from the 3rd District. And both senators from Minnesota are co-sponsors. Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith are both co-sponsors uh, of the um, of the Markey provision three two one eight, which is a very very simple bill. And I think it's important to po point this out. We're not expecting anything really to happen in Washington D.C. Um, well, actually, lots of things are going to happen in Washington D.C. in the next the next couple of months. But really, <laughs> Congress Congress is going to be focusing on things like making sure. The government is stable and that we're, we're activities are funded and then there's going to be this entire question about you know the supreme court confirmation uh transition of power questions in, in cases uh, uh or questions about confirmation of election outcomes i think there's zero expectation that getting co-sponsorship in 2020 means that with the bill will pass however it sets the scene for action in 2021's Congress. And the more people we have coming in as co-sponsors helps us build momentum as that bill is reintroduced and we move forward on, on acting on this. So if there's one ask I've got for you guys is to reach out, particularly in the House of Representatives, to ask for co-sponsorship to join Gwen Moore in the Wisconsin contingent, the co-sponsorship of Anna Eshoo's bill. That's HR 5659, the Protecting Community Television Act. And that simply says that a franchise fee is monetary and that it's basically it, 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 it's an end around to ensure that this FCC's order doesn't further mess with activities at the local level and drain coffers in local communities. I think that's the other important thing about this. In some communities, it's not just peg operations that are being supported by franchise fees. It's police and fire. It's basic city operations. It could be, you know, any of a number of things. So depending upon the size of your city or county and the resources you have, franchise fees actually mean a great deal to be able to sort of keep the doors open. And really, it's important for us to be able to get allies in the door to be able to say to members of the House, we need to hear from you. We think that local government is important. We think that local communication for the communities is important. And we want to have you uh, join with uh, Gwen Moore in the Wisconsin delegation to be a co-sponsor. So that's my ask of you guys today on the federal level. <laughs> Those are sort of the two big things uh, going on right now uh, that I just kind of wanted to mention with the time we've got. Um, is any, any questions about that? Or do people need like supplementary material or anything like that? Because I can provide that for you offline if you'd like. Right. Just to <laughs> provide a little overview. So, you know, what happened was we always used to be able to ask for a 5% franchise fee plus uh, additional equipment, um, uh, operating funds for facilities, etc. And what the FCC basically said is municipalities are capped at 5% and anything that they get from the cable operator, whether it's fees or operating, for INETs, for facilities, that all has to be capped at a 5% level. Of, well, uh, 
cable well, company gross uh, revenue. Revenue. But even but even further further the rulemaking contemplated all sorts of other things that could be defined as in kind support. So that could have been customer service standards. It could have been build out provisions, um, networks. It could have been any of a number of things. Well, and so anyway, and, what I'm trying to make so, it more simple. Yeah, then yeah, I, yeah. don't complicate it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, so but, anyway, but the, cable, but the, the peg the, peg capital was set aside from that, but we don't get that anymore. We don't get any capital funds uh, from the cable companies. Our peg fee was eliminated in 2011. Um, and, but it, it does, could include transport uh, upstream, but again, with our fees down to four, um, you know, there's wiggle room there for operating transport fees going up uh, to the head end. Um, and then, the other issue was channels, as Mike brought up, but they, the FCC declined to talk about channels in the last order. They said they were going to come up with another one within a year. It's been about a year, hasn't it? Yeah, but uh, I, um, I, I, that's a, that's so, a, but you know what? There's nothing in law about, about a promise that you make, right? So who well, knows? Just, who knows? Who is, I'm just, I'm just, just hasn't come out yet. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, you should not be, <laughs> you should not be breathing, breathing comfortably. No, but I also don't want to, I don't want to scare people unnecessarily. No, no. I, I, that, that's my I, I, but, own concern. Yeah. But I, I think the thing I'm asking folks is that they actually need to be engaging with their um, government representation yeah. within their communities, and they need to be contacting the House. Um, Ron Johnson will not be a co-sponsor of this no. bill. No. Um, but you need to be contacting everybody in the House in Wisconsin. And I know you have, I know you have uh, uh, um, in reach with both the Democrat and Republican Party in Wisconsin. So I, you, you, need to be, you need to be reaching out to folks uh, to be able to tell the House members in your districts um, to, that this, this is an important act. Okay, are you going to talk about me? I can. Um, so another sort of Thing that we're monitoring that's happening on a state level, not on the, on the federal level, is a consumer protection law that PEG advocates put together in 2019 in Maine. Um, the, the law basically states that um, a cable company like Charter in this case, and it was Charter that they were targeting, can't um, move a, a channel uh, away from its primary placement near a broadcast channel. Um, cannot um, refuse to transmit in HD. So uh, basically, we'd have to provide an HD channel where the capacity is is uh, is for HD production at the local level, and has to provide electronic program guide access. The, these are all sort of key areas that um, 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 main municipalities have not been able to get. Primarily because main it's a very rural state, it's a small state. Um, the communities in Maine um, uh, that have franchises um, basically are using what is essentially a state template, even though it's locally negotiated, because they don't have they don't have legal capacity to be able to fight a, a legal battle or enter into negotiations with, with a large corporation like a Comcast or uh, a charter. Maine historically had been a Time Warner state, <clears throat> so. Much like Wisconsin, the Time Warner channels went to charter as a result of the, uh, uh, the acquisition of Time Warner several years ago. Um, and um, charter, the, the, the law was, was prompted by a charter moving all of the, the peg channels into, I think it was like a 1300 or a 1700 tier, away from their positions near primary broadcast channels in the lower single digits uh, on the basic tier. Um, the thing that's curious about this is this kind of talks about the value of making sure you're connecting with other states. The folks in Maine actually connected with folks in Hawaii, which was again another Time Warner state that became a charter state because of the takeover. Folks in Hawaii had actually organized to ensure that their channels couldn't be moved and they did that through political action. Uh, and actually now the state of Hawaii has a provision in their agreement with charter that there will be no move of big channels, I think, until 2028 or 2029, something like that, or even into the 2030s. Um, 
So all those channels have maintained their primary positions near broadcast. Um, the Maine legislature put together this bill, um, uh, actually adopted this bill on a bipartisan basis as a consumer protection bill. It wasn't described as a peg channel bill. Um, the idea is, is that the, 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 the advocates putting this bill together specifically talked about the fact that Maine consumers want to have local <laughs> service and they're being denied local service by the actions of the cable industry. Um, so the consumer protection bill passed through the Maine legislature with, um, with, in bipartisan fashion, was signed into law in 2019, and then was immediately challenged by uh, the National Cable Lobby, the NCTA, um, on behalf of Charter. Charter hasn't been an actor in, in the lawsuit against Maine. Um, the state of Maine defended the bill, the bill and won on all counts uh, in, in federal court uh, in Maine. Now the thing is being appealed in Boston in the First Circuit, and uh, we are supporting uh, the legal defense uh, of the bill uh, in a case that's called NCTA versus Frey. Frey is the attorney general in the state of Maine. Um, I think the thing that's important about this is that we're pretty confident that the bill, sh the primary aspects of the bill should stand um, a defense because there's nothing in the Cable Act that prevents the state from enacting consumer protection requirements like Maine has. All right, I mean, you, you, states have the ability to be able to, to support consumers. Uh, and it's not the business of the FCC uh, to put forward laws that hurt consumers, right? Um, so um, framed as a Consumer Protection Act, framed as a, a bill to ensure that consumers can be served by municipalities and nonprofits that are operating these channels, um, we're pretty confident that this bill has a good chance of survival of a, a court channel challenge in federal court. And the state AG's office in Maine has been very, 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 very supportive of this. And they, they, they know the thing backwards and forwards. The thing that's kind of curious about this is that the cable industry will often use state law to under, undermine federal action and federal law to undermine state action and uh, use both of them to undermine local action. So they'll use sort of, sort of like one, one end against the other to be able to get their way. Um, so in this case, we're using the state's consumer uh, protection authorities for these laws to be able to provide um, benefit for communities. Um, and I think a state like Wisconsin might be interested in something like this if it survives court challenge, because it talks specifically about fairness. And, it's, uh, and when you're talking about fairness and equity and, and the ability for local communities of all sizes, urban communities, rural communities, small communities don't have a lot of power. They just wanna actually help with public safety, help with education, help with local culture. And, and talk about the life of the town, that's actually something that both Republicans and Democrats can typically get behind. Um, so, I, I, you know, I've been talking about this bill with other folks around the state, uh, the states, um, and this is actually something that, that, you know, might be curious to see in Wisconsin particularly because you are a charter state. Um, and uh, you've got, uh, I think, uh, a lot of small towns that don't have a lot of uh, power when it comes to negotiating with, with corporations, particularly. Um, and, I, and I think that there, there's uh, some interesting parallels to, to be had. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting case that we're monitoring and, and I know you kind of been kind of apprising Mary a little bit about it too. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about Wisconsin. Um, so as you all know, we're also a, like a state franchise state, so we don't have local franchises. Um, our state franchise situation began in 2007 when the state passed the law um, banning local franchises. So any change we want in our agreement with cable operators has to come through legislation. So last session, um, which is just really finishing up now, um, we crafted a bill with the help of Representative Hebel's office and we ended up not introducing it uh, because we found that Republicans were telling us that if we introduced a bill with a Democrat on it, they would not be supportive. And so we decided to hold our fire until next session so that we could hopefully find a Republican to um, work with us on a bill. And uh, at this time, 
we have we are working with somebody uh, we'll see what happens because in Wisconsin the cable lobby is very powerful um, uh, Senator uh, Scott Fitzgerald uh, who is the majority leader on the Senate side uh, was very much an ally of the cable industry and he is now going to be a congressional representative in the Milwaukee area uh, taking over for a retiring uh, Sensenbrenner. So he's not going to be there anymore, but it's not like uh, Fitzgerald was his own, their only friend. Um, but uh, I just want to go over the, the provisions that we're going for in a change in law. And again, with the understanding that we are dominated by Republicans in both houses and um, historically they've been very uh, sympathetic to the cable industry. In fact, in the last session in the budget process, uh, they just carte blanche uh, reduced franchise fees that video service providers pay from 5% to 4%. And because they knew cities wouldn't be able to tolerate that deep cut in their revenue, uh, they instituted revenue sharing to make up for the loss. So um, taxpayers are now paying part of the franchise fees that video service providers would normally have paid, which you know, I think is annoying, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, they felt sorry for the cable operators, felt like they were losing revenue and they felt they needed a break. So um, to get to our, the bill that we introduced last session, um, it has to do with 100% viewability. We want all customers of cable television to view our peg channels. So we don't want them on higher tiers. We're not going for um, uh, specific channel numbers, um, but we are going for 100% viewability by all customers. Um, secondly, we're going for HD, um, or the highest format in which they provide broadcast affiliates. Um, now, obviously, if a, uh, uh, if uh, an access channel doesn't present their programs in HD, in HD, it's going to be SD. So the highest format in which programs produced or the highest format in which broadcast channels are broadcast. Uh, we would like our program schedules on the electronic program guide. Uh, right now, about six of our access channels, the statewide, are on the electronic program guide with their program schedules. That's it. And Charter has basically indicated to us that they will not put um, any additional channels on the electronic program guide. We've talked to the electronic program guide people. It's a third party vendor. They're happy to do it. It's really a political decision that Charter has made that they don't want to do it. Um, upstream carriage. Um, right now, uh, the way the law is structured, if any of us moves a line or wants to add an upstream line to reach the cable operator, we have to pay for it. Uh, we believe that since cable companies are sole source vendor, that they should pay for it. And in addition, because they just got this break in franchise fees, we think they should be covering all the capital costs for that. They don't ca cover the capital costs for anything else having to do with PEG. Uh, in addition, we think that they should pay for the upstream equipment we have to use. Uh, again, that's because um, they determine how our signal is carried. We think they should pay for the equipment they require us to use. Uh, we've had a lot of problems with matching the antiquated requirements that AT&T requires of us. Um, some of us are still dealing with modulators and analog carriage and having to find this really old equipment. So again, if they want to keep us in the dark ages, then um, they need to find the equipment for us and pay for it. So that's that part of our current bill. Um, the other issue is customer service. We want them to provide us with a direct line to a tech, and we want them to resolve peg signal problems within 24 hours. And uh, we, this, uh, the law that, uh, again, that the legislation we have introduced would give them 120 days to comply with any of the, these new provisions and we would have the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection uh, enforcing these PEG provisions with a $100 per day penalty if they, if they don't. 
So that was the law from the legislation from last session. And what we are adding is uh, in an, to our list of things we want is fair fees. Um, we believe that if uh, video service providers are only going to be assessed a 4% fee, then all municipalities should be able to assess them a 4% fee, or there should be a minimum fee that they're assessed. Right now, because of the way, uh, because of what happened, 46% um, of our municipalities are collecting 3% or less from video service providers. Um, that doesn't include what the, what the taxpayers are paying municipalities. It's, the, it, it's that video service providers are paying 3% of their gross revenues to cities um, out of their own pockets. Uh, so 46% um, of their customers or their client customers, their municipality customers are, uh, they're paying 3% of their fees. Um, I'm not being very clear with that. Um, so 54% of the municipalities getting a fee are now collecting 4% from video service providers. Uh, so we think that video service providers should be paying for the right of way. Some of these municipalities are not even collecting 1% or anything because of the cut in fees. And I can go into how that was done, but um, I won't do it right now. Um, in addition, we've noticed that let's say some little old lady calls and says they can't get a peg channel and our local government wants to intervene on her behalf with charter. Charter won't talk to a local government about a customer service issue. And we think that should change. And then finally, um, we think there should be a searchable database on the, on the state government site that shows where franchises are. So we would like to know where charter is serving, where, um, Comcast is serving, where Solaris is serving. Right now, we don't have that kind of database. Service area data. Service area, yeah. yeah. So actually, that was a little minor win for us um, in January that they did post a PDF of where all of the providers were serving. It was a terrible PDF. It's about six point type. It, it was all in dense paragraphs, but it was there and it included any amendments to their franchise agreements. So like if they added territory or moved territory or uh, had a change in ownership, all that was online, but they took that down and we complained about it recently and they just put it back up. So we now have the terrible PDF back, which is good because, um, but uh, I think it should be in a, in a better, format so that we can find out, do we have competition? Uh, what areas of the state are served by it? How many subscribers are, do, do, do providers have? Uh, they're supposed to file annual reports with that information, but it's hard to get a hold of those and we think municipalities should be able to get access to that information and the public as well if we ask for it. So that's, that's our, our latest three. So it's a little bit more, it's, it's not um, directly related to PEG so much, it's, it's more city rights, um, and, and that's what we're doing. I think Dave had a question about whether or not the League of Municipal Wisconsin Municipalities is aware of, of, of activity. D Dave, could you, could you, could you? Dave who, Dave who? A grooming. Oh, yeah, yes. Um, Actually, we've been working with Kurt very closely because it's very important for the League of Wisconsin Municipalities to support this. So yes, um, he was, we've, we've even shown him our one page summaries of all of these items and he's looked them through and we're all on board together. Uh, Mike or, or Mary, do either the main uh, consumer protection package or what, we're putting together in Wisconsin in terms of proposed legislation address um, peg carried carriage on a um, video providers app. So uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't go for that because that's on the uh, uh, 
broadband services side of the signal and we didn't think we would have any control over that uh, but mike what what do you what's your thoughts the main uh, the main legislation does not specifically countenance that especially if the transmission happens over a wireless provision right so um no it, it does not speak to that um you know uh Trying to remember which which company was providing an, an and was providing an app with transmission to the home uh, for its wired transmission for broadband, but was providing an app rather than a box, and 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 this ended up being sort of like, is that a peg? You know, is, is that subject to, to peg provisions? And it, it sure looks like it, right? Because um, but I can't remember. I I, I I have to tell you this. I I don't remember which specific company is doing that. Um, but I, I think it's an open it's an open question whether or not you'd be able to do that uh, on um, a, on a, an app that's having transmission over uh, wireless. But isn't that a, can that also be a, almost a consumer protection? That consumer that's buying this should get that, and you're and they're being denied. Well, they, I think it's a disclosure issue, Tom. Right, so. You know, if you're if you're buying it and you're being told it's the same thing as your cable service and it's not, that's one thing. If you're buying it and told that, oh well, some provisions may not apply. Da, 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 da. And then, then it goes to this lot, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. The the the, the consumer disclosure is in very, very tiny type, spoken very, very rapidly at the end of a commercial or doesn't even show up except on the, say the uh, licensing agreement when you install the app way, way, way down to the bit, bottom that nobody reads. There could be, they, it may not be effective disclosure, but it could be legal disclosure. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it, it, that, that, that's a question, that's a question I think uh, uh, from a consumer standpoint. Yeah, that's a good point. Jeff Robbins trying to try to get to the bottom of this with um, Mike Hill. And um, Mike Hill said, yes, we offer broadcast channels on our app. You know, you can choose to have those on your app, but <laughs> avoided the question of the peg channels, which, you know, he point blank finally asked him and then there was silence. So, uh, yeah, so that's where it stands. So they obviously can pick up local signals, you know, with this app, but. Well, it's, I mean, I think it's, it ends up being an agreement that the broadcast entity has with the distribution company. So, the, so the, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, do, do municipalities have the uh, power to be able to negotiate anything in a state? And the answer is no. They typically don't have the power to negotiate those types of things. Um, and it's really, it really ends up being the sort of question of federal and state law that, that drives this question too, right? But um, the curious thing that we were thinking about is that it would probably be cheaper for Charter to offer us on an app like this in HD then it might be to offer our access channels in HD on their wired system with cable boxes, et cetera. Well, I think it's probably cheaper for them to hire their lawyers to try to abuse people. <laughs> so, um, which I think is typically their practice. I mean, not yeah. to be cynical. I don't want to. Well, they don't want to. I don't want to be cynical here. Right? Well, they don't want to give any territory. If they give but territory I, to Maine I, or Wisconsin, then. But, but be, be, beyond this question, I think it speaks to the idea that you need to have an app for provision of services that's yours. You can't be depending upon a company to be able to do that. And yeah. this entire question of you know being in sort of a multi-platform environment, that's something that you've got to control because the company is not going to do that for you. And you can't expect that that's going to happen. So you've got to be able to you know promote programming, services, multi-platforms. It's got to be something that you can control. These bills, particularly in Maine, are about fairness. And, and I think broadcasters are on our side on this question because if a cable company can basically not provide electronic program guided information for us, they can do the same thing for broadcasters. They could basically screw with, a, I mean, let's say, say for example, a Comcast, which owns NBC Universal, theoretically could screw with their, with their competitors in terms of promotion or channel quality or the like. Why don't they do that? Well, it's because of the relative commercial power of their competitors. And the fact that we don't have much power means that they can screw with us. So uh, the, we've got to be finding ways to be able to build more power so that, that we, they've got protections so they don't have the ability to abuse their, their market. Um, 
to the million, do million dollar thing, million totally. dollar statement. Totally. totally. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm happy to talk with you guys more uh, offline because um, I know our, our time is short here and you got to go to the next thing. Um, but it's great to see everybody and great to meet new folks um, and uh, happy to be supporting the work that's going on there. And please uh, reach out to members of the House about the Protecting Community Television Act. Ask for, for co-sponsorship. Even in the next 30 days, it's important for us to be making those asks. So uh, I really deeply appreciate you guys doing that work. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys. Be well.